The webinar will cover Wyoming Water Development Office's GIS data collection and management standards, which is an effort that was initiated in 2016 to improve management of the GIS data and is developed for uh, level one and level two planning projects. Throughout this process and working with a multi-agency steering group, core data sets, which are key to the business needs of our agency, as well as other agencies were defined. And those data sets are considered core, are the ones that support understanding of water use, water supply, and water project feasibility. Uh, we appreciate your participation in the pre-webinar survey that was sent out, and also your participation here in this webinar. Um, from that survey, we did learn that most of you are participating today. Well, you've previously dealt with standards in your GIS work, and your responses also helped us uh, frame some of the areas of emphasis in this uh, webinar today. Uh, implementation of the data modernization and compiling the incoming project data over the last few years has resulted in some fine tuning and some not so fine tuning and updating of data templates and standards. Uh, so currently we're on version four of the standards document. And since this was a uh, pretty big overhaul, more so than usual, we've uh, synced the 2024 version of the templates. So they're also version 4.0 and keep those in, keep those in sync. And cannot stress this enough, please make sure that you use the current versions for your projects. So beginning in uh, 2018, the Wyoming Water Development Commission implemented standards for the GIS deliverables from consultants. Um, these standards increase consistency, reduce duplication of effort between projects, as well as provide a, a clear understanding of the data produced for projects funded by the WDC. Standardization of the data sets is critical to effectively incorporating the data into future decision support system to assist water resource decision making. Uh, there have been some iterations through time in the GIS standards version 4.0 document, which was prepared this year, details the methods and uh, data necessary uh, to meet those standards. Earlier, I mentioned the goal of modernizing and standardizing the data collected as part of water development projects. Uh, the standardization resulted in a framework for the core data sets and the templates and is based on the common sets of data gathered during water development projects. The framework consists of four categories of data or four data sets. The assessment data set uh, organizes key data related to water use, changes over time, and ground conditions. Uh, included here are mapping of irrigated lands and Rosgen assessment. The hydrology data set contains information on both measured and modeled stream flow data. Uh, the water projects data set includes the study area boundaries and tracks potential projects along with their size, costs, and how these potential projects fit into our funding programs. And then the water systems data set contains everything on uh, the existing network to distribute water, uh, includes both the built environment of conveyances and structures as well as the water rights. Uh, place of use, points of diversion associated with the water use. Only a subset of these core feature classes will be required for your project, and this will be described in a few minutes when we go over how to access those templates. So just a, a brief uh, preview of coming attractions for the webinar. We'll cover new features or requirements and standards for this year. We'll provide some tips so that your data deliverables meet these standards. Uh, we'll go over some specifics on the contracts and how they relate to GIS deliverables. And then finally, we'll open it up for questions and discussion. So let's just quickly look at what is new to the procedure for 2024 while someone joins the call. So what's new? Well, as part of the critical aging irrigation infrastructure study, some new fields have been added to the template to assist with some subsequent inventories. Uh, CAII ident field was added to uniquely identify structures. Uh, condition fields were added for the structures, conveyances, and reservoirs. Uh, the former condition field was actually more accurately a status description, so it has been renamed status to reflect that. And finally, a field to capture the number of dependent acres or the number of acres that would be impacted should a structure fail has been added. Uh, somewhat of a big one is that the legacy POU tool does not work in ArcPro, and from the survey responses, a uh, majority of consultants are using ArcPro, so a whole new set of detailed manual instructions has been created uh, for putting together the POU and POD feature classes. And finally, the water resource data system will be working with project managers as we go through these, uh, you know, looking at the uh, GIS deliverables that are submitted to help ensure that the most thorough and timely review is given for the, for the products. 
While the current version is 4.0, we do expect that a 4.x will be coming out for next year, so stay tuned for that. Uh, some of that will be driven by additional requirements being brought about by the critical aging irrigation infrastructure. And also some of that is also in response to the feedback that we got from you folks here online through the survey and, and through other means. So now to go over the aspects for what makes uh, the most successful of deliver deliverables, I'll turn it over to Bryce to go into those. All right. Thank you, Tony. You're welcome, Bryce. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. So I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah. So there's these 12 points are outlined in our standards document, our mem tech memo, uh, technical memo. So I'll be going over a lot of these, uh, basically how to download the templates, where you need to go to download them, what template types we have, what is in those templates, what you can and can't do with those templates, and then what we expect as an end result and an end deliverable from those templates. So that URL is where you go to download our templates. You can also access that through WWDC's website. Uh, there are five template types which are listed there based on your project type. That's the template you'll use and you'll download. And each of those templates has core data sets and core feature classes, which are logically nestled under the core data sets. And not all of those templates, they have very specific data sets and core feature classes in them specific to the project. So not, not everything is included with all these templates. It's very template specific. And each of those we'd like filled out as much as possible, as many of the attributes filled out as possible. Uh, there are similar, so study area, potential projects, that's something we ask for with every project and full POU. So those are the three feature classes you'll see in all across all those. But other than that, it's gonna be very template specific. So know the project you're working on and be sure you grab the right template. All right, so core data. The core feature classes we want filled out, populated. If they are not populated, we would like an explanation in the metadata why that's the case. There could be reasons why something was not populated, but we'd like those populated as much as possible and as many of the attributes filled out as possible. Uh, it's really important when you're working with this core data, with these templates, the attribute field types, lengths, number formats, and domains are very specific to those templates. Do not alter those at all. If you have a text field length that you're trying to put into an attribute that is text, but it's too long in your GIS data, and we try and append that into our master geo database, it'll truncate that text and we lose that data. So it's important to maintain our templates as they are. And there's two kinds of things I broke this down into. You have new data, and old data or third-party data. New data is pretty easy. As you're out collecting that, you have this template. So you can see what we're asking for with each of these attributes. You can build a, a database and a data dictionary in your GPS to collect that data. Probably the issues are gonna come from older data. How do you get the old data into these templates? Because that old data might have two attributes and one of them might make sense and the other one doesn't make sense. So with the old data, we would ask that you try and append as much of that into the data set as possible. If it's a structure, vowels, for example, we have WDO structures layer, which we would ask that to be appended into. And then let's say there's a diameter measurement as one of those attributes, but it's in feet and not inches. And our template asks for diameters in inches. So in that case, we would ask you to convert that data from its measurement into inches, then put that into our template. And in the metadata, you can explain, here's what we did to this data in order to make it fit. And that won't always be the case. And if it's not the case, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But yeah, those core feature classes, we want as much data, new data and old data that you can get into those feature classes uh, populated as much as possible. Okay, so the linking tables. If you have an attribute from third-party data or an attribute even maybe you collected 
but there's no place in our template for that attribute to be placed. We have in our in all the templates we provide a project specific table name. Uh, in this image, you can see it to the right. It's a linking table. And we have a in our default linking table, we have a certain attributes that you can use to fill out, for example, convey ID. So in WDO conveyance, convey ID is one of the attributes. So what you do is you create that ID, which we have instructions in Appendix C of the tech memo, how to do that. You create that, you append as much of the data as you can into the template. Then the attributes that cannot go into the template, you will add those to this table and then use the convey ID, WDO strid if it's WDO structures to link those records to the feature in our core feature class. So I, I think new data is not gonna be an issue. It's gonna be the older data. What format is that in? What attributes are there? And how do you get that into the template? And some of that might have to be a discussion with the project manager if you're not sure where something should go, ask them and we can have a discussion about that. And the last bit to this is you may have a completely separate shape file uh, that is supplementary to what we require, doesn't logically fit into any of our template core feature classes. If that's the case, we ask you to submit that as an auxiliary data set. And it can either be its own geodatabase, it can be included in this geodatabase as its own layer uh, or its own shape file. But it's, sometimes you may have data that just will not go into the template, and we would ask for that to be submitted as its own standalone auxiliary data with metadata, which I'll talk about metadata in a minute. Okay, so renaming stuff. We've seen this uh, happen, and so we figured we'd just nip it in the butt right now. So naming these things, we ask that you rename the deliverable geodatabase or map package, however you're submitting it to us, we ask that you rename that. And if you use that project specific linking table, we have a procedure for how to name that linking table, which tells us what it is and what it's linked to. So in this case, the deliverable geo database, if you downloaded it, would be WW or WDO irrigation district template 4.0. So we would ask that you add the entity that this project is working for and the date that the project is also. So that way we can look at that and we know, okay, irrigation study using template 4.0 for this project right off the bat without even opening up the, the geo database. Uh, also, in the templates, the core data sets, water systems, water projects, their names, stuff like that, and also the core feature classes, WDO conveyance, WDO structures, do not rename any of those. Keep those the exact same name as they are. There's no real reason to rename them, but uh, we have seen that. Yeah. All right. Okay. So for the new data and third party data, uh, when you're putting this into the template, consolidate as much as you can. We have WDO structures, which is, which is a point layer, WDO conveyance, which is linears, and reservoirs, which is polygons. So if it's a valve, uh, some point structure like that, we would ask that to be in WDO structures. There's domains you can look through in these templates to see, and you know, we have 35 structure types, and then we even have for the last one, other. So if we don't have the specific structure type, still put it in there, you would use the domain other, and then explain in the comments what structure this is. So yeah, point features, head gates, pumps, valves, meters, all consolidated in structures, tunnels, pipelines, uh, conveyance stitches would be conveyances. And if you do need additional attributes, uh, again, you use that linking table. Do not add them to these layers. Don't, don't alter the template at all in order to make the data fit. Use that linking table, the project specific linking table. Okay, so, and when you're renaming that table, be sure to include what it is. So WDO conveyance, that the example we gave on the last slide was, uh, that was a raster 
attributes. So they were adding photos to that point using the linking table. So they, they said WDO conveyance photos. Yeah. All right, so potential projects. One of the layers we have is potential projects, and that's very specifically a point layer. But the issue, the issue with structures isn't, I mean, that's if it's a point feature that is a potential project, that's not a problem. The issue becomes if it's a linear or polygon, what do you do with that? How do you get that data into the point layer for potential projects? Because we require potential projects no matter which template you're working on. Uh, so the way we've asked that this be done is for linears, the very first point of the starting point of that linear, that'll be your potential project point that you'd put in there. For a polygon, it'd be just the centroid of the polygon, like a reservoir. So on our end, you know, we look at this, okay, we have a point, a potential project, but it's a linear. We don't necessarily know where that linear goes. So we ask if you have that data, the actual linear path of where the conveyance is gonna go pr to provide that to us as an auxiliary layer. You may not always have them, it just happens. But if you do have that layer, we would ask that you submit that along with the points in potential projects. All right, so metadata, like the most important part of all of this, it, it sucks to fill out, I know, but this is really one of the most important things we need. And we need it at a geodatabase level, feature class level, and then individual features. So geodatabase and all feature classes, the metadata will look like this example right here. And in our template that we include default metadata descriptions, which are these, and you do not have to follow this. This is just a suggestion of the information we're looking for specifically. You may not be able to fill all of it out, but we'd like as much of this information as possible provided uh, for the geodatabase for all feature classes and linking tables also. The individual feature metadata, we're referring to these attributes specifically, contract ID, contractor, creation edit date, and horizontal accuracy. Every feature class has those attributes and we would ask that those be filled in for every feature included with those layers. So you can find a lot of this information about metadata in section 2.1 the GIS standards, you'll find tables where they talk, like we give examples like this, and then we have a table that explains what we're looking for as a description for each of these. This is just a hypothetical data set. Also, please alter, like we've we've gotten submittals that just have this default metadata in it. Like, <laughs> please change the metadata and just tell us, it is the most important thing. One reason also why we do this is, We've gotten third-party data and auxiliary data that the attribute is just the title of it is like lowercase d. And sometimes we can figure out what that attribute means and sometimes we can't. So if we can't, then that data is lost. So if there's if you're providing auxiliary data uh, that has its own attributes, please in the metadata explain what each of those attributes are, especially if it's something that doesn't make sense like diameters or or lengths of conveyances. Okay, if a core feature class is not populated as part of your project, we do ask that you mention why that's the case in the metadata. Otherwise, we just have this blank layer. We don't know if it was supposed to be blank or not supposed to be blank. Uh, we don't know what to do with that. And when, okay, the third party data, if you do acquire and or edit data from a third party. In the metadata, we would like to know when and from whom you got that data and any, edit, any edits you made to it, either on your own or in order to get some of the attributes to fit into our template, what you did specifically with each of those. It can get tedious, but we really, we just need to know some what that procedure is. And some steps just in your own mind as you're looking at that data that we ask you, because we we don't know the accuracy of, the, of this data or anything. So we would just ask you trust the accuracy of, of this data, make sure you trust the accuracy of the data, uh, ensure validity, go out, check a couple points, make sure the points are mapped correctly. 
Uh, you'll probably have to verify some of that just to make sure. And the metadata, I'm guessing 99% of the time will not be included in this third-party data. So try and figure out if there is metadata. Uh, and if not, then again, explain where you got the data from, when, acknowledge that despite your best efforts, you could not find the original metadata. And you may be using pro uh, project data from old WDO projects, in which case we would like to know uh, the project's name and the date, where that data came from. All right, and there are a few other new attributes that we're requiring for irrigation studies, which Maple's gonna talk about here in a, in a minute. The linking table metadata, still need metadata with that. Explain the attributes, uh, what it represents. Uh, you can do that in the description sections. And especially if you're using coded values, especially if you're using coded values, we need to know what those are and what they represent. So with that, I'll pass it off to Mabel to talk about the new irrigation study uh, attributes and contracts. All right. Um, so many of you may be aware that our office recently completed a statewide um, critical aging infrastructure study for irrigation um, entities in Wyoming. And this work resulted in a database of 11,000 structures where criticality was calculated for the structures. Um, this was based on condition, the infrastructure type, um, farm acres that would be impacted if the structure failed. And so our office is committed to maintaining and keeping this um, data set updated and continuing, can you, continuing to work on this data set. And with the irrigation projects that are um, being undertaken this year, this will be a tool to go back and um, pull those, look at that uh, initial work um, and update that based on these 2024 projects and um, that work. So for consultants who have um, irrigation projects, um, they should work through their project managers to request a subset of that critical aging um, data from our office. Um, so that, that you can see what was done previously and work with that. Um, so four attributes in the geodatabase templates were added or updated based on the study. We've mentioned that a few times during the um, presentation um, and they're listed here. Um, one was the condition field. We updated our old condition field to um, reflect structure condition. Um, this is the um, condition of the structure itself, not the functionality. So say if you had a siphon that um, was in good state, good condition structurally, but it was um, had a lot of sediment, um, that type of thing, it needed maintenance, it would be uh, ranked as good. So we're not looking at um, maintenance needs, we're looking at actual the structural integrity of those um, that infrastructure. So um, the condition field is captured in domains in the geodatabase. Um, and we have definitions in there there as well. So for good structures, they show little signs of deterioration, they're fully functional. Um, fair structures show superficial cracking or spalling. Poor cracking may extend through the depths of the structures. There may be significant spalling. Settlement of the structure, piping might be evident where it shouldn't be. And then ele elements of the structure are damaged or non-functional, not the entire structure being non-functional, but el elements of it being non-functional. And then failing, um, the structure is not functional. Um, there might be exposed elements of the structure, portion of the structure of separated, undermining may be present. Um, and with the failing structures, it is assumed that they have a life of um, less than five years. And then status unknown, because we know that as folks are going out and inventorying, they may not hit every manhole, every you know, um, every turnout, that type of thing. And so we do understand that there may be some of those that are unknown just because of the workload related to the project. Um, we are asking that condition be completed for both irrigation and municipal projects. So infrastructure type, um, this attribute has been included in previous versions of the templates and includes domains referring to the type of structure, such as a pump, a diversion, a well, and so on. Some additional values have been added to the do domains based on the critical aging structure, and we do consider this to be a field that is required 
for both um, irrigation and municipal projects as it describes your mapped feature. So the CAII ident field, this is for irrigation studies only. Um, this is a unique identifier that will be used to link this back to that data set that our office just completed. Um, again, as mentioned before, legacy data will need to be acquired from our office to utilize existing um, identifying fields. Um, you will need to assign a new value if it was not previously in inventory. Um, and the instructions for doing that are in Appendix C of the technical memo on our website. And then the, and then dependent acres, this is for irrigation studies only. Um, so this attributes defines the number of irrigated acres that would be impacted by a structure's failure. For instance, um, if the, the diversion um, failed at the um, point of delivery um, and you had a 10,000 acre irrigation district, then that dependent acres out values would be 10,000. If it was a um, siphon that was um, that would impact 50% of the irrigation irrigated acres, then your value for ir dependent acres may be 5,000 acres. For irrigation um, projects, um, this can be determined by computing the sum of irrigated acres downstream of a structure, and you will need to develop a method for calculating dependent acres, which is practical based on the complexity and size of the irrigation district. So um, this next section will, we, I might want to talk just a little bit about um, the contract. Um, I'm, the spatial data requirements are outlined in the contract specifications um, in the scope of services under C2B. We do recommend that the project lead share the contract language with the GIS folks who will be involved in um, putting together the GIS projects if they have not done so already. So this is a pretty busy slide. There's a lot going on here, but um, these are just um, screenshots, screenshots from some of the, the contract and then also the notice to proceed that will go out. Um, so the contract requirements are spelled out in section C2BI. Um, as we discuss this, it can serve as reinforcement for several of the points that Tony and Bryce brought up um, and also provides information regarding submitting deliverables that are not included in the technical memo. So under section one, this includes um, covers feature mapping. So the contract specifies that the court consultant should acquire the appropriate geo, geo database template. So if you've worked with our um, templates before, make sure you go and download that 4.0. Um, don't work with one that you may have already downloaded for a previous project. Um, so we recommend that you download and use the templates early on to avoid having to retrofit your data into the required format for final deliverables. And then also um, touch base early and often with words with your project manager if you have questions on working with the templates. Um, seems like we have a lot of frequent flyers that have um, worked with these before and our deliverables are getting better, but um, you know, check in early and often so we can get good deliverables. Um, core data and auxiliary data are also addressed in the contract. Bryce talked about that quite a bit. Um, and just as a reminder, the core data have a subset of fields that are required in all feature classes. Um, this is also mentioned in the contract, um, contract number, primary consultant, date modified, and accuracy um, are those fields that have to be filled in for every feature class. Um, for the contract number, um, you may or may not see that. That's included on the first page of the contract and it's highlighted here. Um, it begins with three numbers followed by CM, and then it's followed by numbers. Uh, this should not be confused with the RN number that is on each page of your contract. Um, one thing, the contract number is assigned after um, the contract is fully executed or everybody signed the contract. So you may not see it on your copy if you did not receive the fully executed version. Um, and the contract number is also included in the notice to proceed letter um, from your project manager. Auxiliary data sets are also discussed in the contract and include features which don't fit in one of the feature classes in the geodatabase templates. Um, this might include photos, CPG areas, um, line work for polygons for potential projects, 
since potential projects are delivered as a point layer. The auxiliary data can be leaked into the templates or managed separately as needed for project completion. And they can be submitted, um, auxiliary data sets can be submitted as geodatabase files or as separate feature classes or shape files. And again, metadata is required for those auxiliary data sets. So section two of the GIS project requirements in the contract includes formats and standards for metadata and coordinate system. Um, the data from your project should be delivered in a geodatabase with your project rather than in individual feature classes. This geodatabase needs to include all the feature classes like um, Bryce had mentioned. If, and again, if you did not populate a feature class, you still need to include it, but indicate what in the metadata why it was not populated. Section three of the contract talks about project requirements and addresses map layouts. Um, we ask that the deliverables be organized in a way to allow easy replication, replication of your map layouts um, that are in the final project report. The geo, GIS project files, um, we in the contract, we ask that they be provided as um, ArcGIS MXD files or Arc Pro project files saved with relative path names to the data sources. Um, we have had a request to submit those as project packages because it's more efficient um, for the consultants to do that. And based on some internal discussion, we will accept ARC Pro um, packages if, if that's easier for you all. Um, and we can we can work with those here. Again, and then I guess another thing, it is preferred to get the layouts that correspond to the figures in your report in a single file instead of um, uh, multiple projects for every map in your report. So you could just add multiple layouts to your ARC Pro package, um, our ARC Pro project. And again, um, we will accept those um, map packages if that's more a more efficient method of delivery for you. Okay. So when the GIS data is submitted to um, our office as part of your draft reporting, it will go to your WWDO project manager first, and they're going to um, pull out this checklist and fill it out. Um, once they do that, um, they will provide the data to the water resources data system, collaborate with them, make sure that it's going to import well into the master data sets, um, and words will be looking for um, working through a checklist similar to this as well um, to make sure that that draft data is, um, is um, meeting standards. So there are a couple of points I just want to highlight um, based on the GIS checklist. Um, we'll be looking at making sure the correct template was used. Um, it will be evaluated by comparing actual to expected for core feature classes and tables. Um, all the, again, all the feature classes in your template are supposed to be populated with data for your project. Um, and like we mentioned before, if you don't populate one, for instance, um, you're working on an irrigation project where their water source is all surface water, um, WDO reservoirs would not be populated, but let us know why, um, because it's not applicable to this project. Um, um, also, your project manager will check to see if each core feature class has all the attributes and only appropriate ap attributes. So they'll be going and looking through, making sure that additional attributes were not added or attributes were not taken out. Um, again, not all attributes included in the template feature classes may be populated in every case, but the majority should be, and we want to see that there has been effort put into populating the features classes um, so that this data is useful into the future. Um, again, be looking at whether all metadata is included, and then finally, um, making sure that the maps in, prepared for the report are submitted as layouts within an ARC map or ARC Pro project file or ARC Pro project package. Um, for your reference, this checklist is included on the website. So it's probably not a bad thing to go through before you submit your drafts to our office. Um, so you can um, get, one, get one step ahead of your project manager 
and our office is going to review, be reviewing your data. So um, just want to um, thank you for participating in the webinar. We'll be posting this on our website for our reference. Um, if you have new GIS people who come on over the course of your projects, please direct them to the webinar and other supporting materials on the web. Um, our goal is that these materials and future conversations with us will help you generate and submit deliverables correctly the first time.